Good morning, or good afternoon, and welcome to worship at Grace Community Church. We are so glad that you're able to join us as we meet online to glorify the Lord together. Normally, we meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for worship. We will be holding this Sunday our second drive-in or no-touch service at 9 a.m. in the parking lot of our church. We had a wonderful time last Sunday celebrating Easter during the drive-in service. This week, we have a vastly improved transmitting system, so please come if you are able. And now, will you please join me in the call to worship? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. For there is no commandment greater than these. Therefore, let us worship the Lord together with all that we are, giving glory to him and honor and blessing. Amen.
first story ever told. And it is still told today, and will be till the end of time. Hallelujah! Praise the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world.
And now we'll quiet our hearts as we come to the Lord in prayer. Jesus said to him, 
What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? The lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Here ends this reading from the Gospel of Luke.
So glad that you could join us to celebrate the resurrection, either online or out in the drive-in parking lot service last Sunday. What a glorious day it was. How much I sensed God working in our hearts, moving us, motivating us, changing us. We had so many new people joining us, and, and I just want to welcome you. It, it really warms my heart to know that you were able to join us last Sunday. We're going to do another drive-in service. I hope you'll join us for that, and I hope you'll continue to join us here online. As you'll recall from last week's sermon, the disciples were dramatically changed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It changed everything. Jesus was walking along with the disciple, two of the disciples on the road to Damascus, and they didn't know who he was, and they talked for hours, and Jesus revealed to them all of the scriptures. And that, I don't know how you do that. It must have been one whale of a sermon. All of the scriptures that pointed to him as the fulfillment of messianic prophecy. Now that's powerful stuff. And then when they broke bread together, he revealed himself to them. And then he disappeared. And what did the scriptures say? Did not our hearts burn within us while he... He talked with us on the road while he opened the scriptures. Wow. Those disciples, like the rest of the disciples after Jesus' crucifixion, were confused, frightened, demoralized. They felt hopeless. Nothing made sense. Everything that they thought was coming together in, in one beautiful package was was, was shattered. The week before, the crowds had coronated him as the conquering king, the one who would set them free from Rome. That made perfect sense. After all, they'd seen Jesus do so many things that were undeniable. They, they saw him heal the sick and restore the leper and made the, he made the lame to walk and the blind to see. He, he, he raised the people from the dead and he calmed the storm. He, he walked on water and he turned water into wine. And he took a couple of fish and some little loaves of bread and he fed thousands on it. It was amazing. Jesus was unafraid to challenge the religious establishment and so it just made sense that he would be the one who would throw the Roman occupiers out of Israel. But then there was the mocking and Spittle and the scorn and the scourge and the thorns and the nails and the spear and the stone and the tomb and the that dark, dark, cold tomb. Everything that they had come to believe about Jesus was over. It was finished. And Jesus said it was finished on the cross. All the miracles weren't enough for them to believe. Oh. They were downhearted, disheartened. Their hearts were growing cold. Like the rest of the disciples, they had to figure out how to pick up the pieces. Run, hide, go back to work. But that Sunday was like no other Sunday. That Sunday they got their Lord back and they got their hearts back. The stone had been rolled away, the tomb was empty, and Jesus began to appear to all kinds of people over the next 40 days. After his ascension to heaven, the, the arrival of the, the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, their hearts were so much on fire that nothing in this world could quench it. Day after day, they met together in the courts, and, and, and in each other's homes. They prayed together, worshipped together, witnessed together, and the Lord added daily to their number those who were being saved, thousands upon thousands. It was a multitude. What made it all happen? What changed things? Well, I believe the resurrection of our Lord was finally enough for the disciples. I mean, really, they must have said, who can raise themselves from the dead? Only God. And that was enough for them to finally say in their heart of hearts, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I am fully yours. Take me. Be glorified in me. Use me. All that I am, all that I have, all that I'll ever be belongs to you. His resurrection was more than enough. And they finally gave God what he really wants. Their hearts. 
You ever wondered what God really wants from you? Does he want you to be good? Does he want you to be responsible? Sure he does. He wants you to help other people, of course. But what he wants most from you is your heart. I think the disciples finally understood that when, when they saw the risen Lord. They had to have remembered his teachings about the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then, of course, the second command is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. See, that's what they did after the resurrection. They loved the Lord in ways that so many of us can only imagine. Do you realize that every single one of those disciples died a martyr's death except one, and that was John. He died while he was exiled on the island of Patmos? I'm even doubting Thomas, who said, I'm not going to believe unless I can put my fingers in his wounds, fell to his knees when he saw the risen Lord and said, my Lord and my God. Now that's passion, friends. These disciples had passion. But what keeps us from that kind of passion? How come we don't have that kind of passion all the time? What keeps our hearts from burning like the disciples? God wants us to love, love Him. But we often just don't know how to love Him. We were made to be relational beings. We were made to love each other. We were made to love God, but we, we often haven't got a clue as to how to give it or how to take it. It's a problem. When it comes to loving our God, our problem is pretty simple. It's our heart. It's our heart. God made us with hearts to be able to love, but we've experienced the, the effects of, of the fall. We have heart troubles now. We have heart problems. As David said in Psalm 51, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. What's he saying here? He's saying that we were all born with a congenital heart defect. We were all born with a sinful heart, a slanted heart, if you will. Now, those of you who are golfers know that 99% of the, the golf greens are not built with a, a, a direct course right to the cup. You just don't have a flat line to the cup. And in fact, if you play golf, you know that there's always some sort of a slant that causes your ball to roll in a different direction, and it, it's intentionally frustrating. So the game isn't as simple as you think, nor is the game of life. No matter how hard you aim a child at a target to do right, to think right, to be right, there's a bias in the human heart that takes it in the wrong direction. The good things we want to do, we don't do. And we do things that we don't want to do, as Paul said in Romans 7, 19. There's a problem. The problem is there's no health in us. God knows it. He can see inside of us. The people look at the outside, but God looks down within our hearts and he can see us from for everything that we are, and he says the diagnosis of the human heart is evil all the time. Ooh, some of us really find it hard to hear those words. No, but the truth is we don't think the thoughts that God thinks. We don't do the things that God does. And so how can our sinful hearts really love God? Is, is, is this the, the heart that's going to share the gospel with a, a neighbor? Is this the heart that's going to show kindness to someone who's without food? Is this the heart that's going to shine the light and love of Christ in the dark alleyways and in the rescue missions and uh, when we're out in the world at large? Is, is this the heart? No. No, it isn't. Something has to happen to our hearts. In fact, Jesus said, out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, 
sexual immorality, theft, lies, slanders. What? What do we need? Bypass surgery? No. We don't need bypass surgery. Only a new heart will truly allow us to love God and, and others in the way that He designed, that He desires. Only a new heart. What we need is a transplant. If, if there were a way that I could receive a new heart, a, a heart that would naturally love God and love my neighbor as, I, as much as I love myself, then I might have a chance to do the thing that God and Jesus have called all of us to do. But how do I get that transplant? The Bible actually tells us in the book of Ezekiel how that works. I, says the Lord, I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit in you, and I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit in you and, and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So there you have it. Ezekiel tells us that we can have a transplant, a heart transplant. God's going to remove our stony, selfish hearts and give us a heart of flesh. A heart that beats when people are in trouble. A heart that cares when a man falls in a ditch. But if you're going to have to have a transplant, you've got to have a donor. A woman that I met a couple of years ago and uh, worshipped with uh, told me a story about her son who, in a terrible accident, was, was hit while he was riding his bicycle and didn't survive. When she got to the hospital, it was horrifying for her to hear the words, your son is brain dead, he's not going to live. And then in the next moment, she was further shocked by the words, there's another little boy who needs his heart. But without skipping a beat, as she melted into tears, she said, yes, yes. She knew there was another mother praying by that bedside, longing for a heart for her son that he might live. And that's exactly what happened. She said yes. When God looked down at humankind and saw that the only transplant that would work for us was a divine transplant, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity said take my heart and God did and on an operating table the shape of a cross the great physician lifted out that heart and the nature of Jesus Christ and he offered them to us the world that he so loved he offered his heart because he knew that our hearts would never love him the way we're supposed to See, you can take our hearts in our human form. Just You can take our hearts, you can sit it, you can take it to church, you can sit it in a pew, you can give it a hymn book, you can teach it how it should be a good little Christian heart, and it's still the same old wicked heart that we were born with. But when you and I, as the Bible says, become a partaker of the divine nature and receive Jesus' heart, Jesus' nature, Jesus himself, by His Holy Spirit, then all of our valves are opened up and we have the possibility of loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, strength. It's amazing. And yes, I, I remember. I remember when I did this. I remember when I said yes to the Lord. When I said, I've, I've heard enough. I've seen enough. Lord, I want your heart. I was a student at Miami University in Ohio. And when someone explained how I could receive Jesus and his nature, and that somehow, through me, he could do what he does, and love people the way he loved them, and love the Father the way he loved them, I said, yes, yes, I want this more than anything else in the world. And after that transplant, I'll tell you what, I experienced a desire to love God with, with all that I was. Now, what's that mean? 
Right? Does that mean I was absolutely perfect in every way? Hmm. Oh, it really didn't mean I was perfect in every way. I, I still struggled with life, but I'll tell you what, God brought me so much joy that I more and more wanted to love God, more and more wanted to serve God, more and more wanted to obey God. It wasn't that I was sinless, but I started to sin a whole lot less. And I found myself loving more and more. More and more I listened to his voice, and he would guide me in his ways as opposed to the ways of the world. And, and sure, there have been plenty of times where I've re resisted, where I've wrestled with God. But then, after a while, you start to just say, Lord, your ways are so much better than my ways. Oh, change me. Move this part of me away so that I might really grow close to you in my soul. You see, what I found was the more I walked with the Lord, the more I wanted to spend time in His presence, the more I wanted to spend time in prayer, the more I wanted to spend time in His Word, the more I wanted to do what He wanted me to do, because there was delight in that. And, and to be able to delight the Lord, wow, and to delight in the Lord, and it's not just a one-way thing. You begin to delight in the Lord. It's a joy to, to cause him his heart joy. See, I also found that I started to long to be with God's people as well. Now, I know, I know. Everybody goes, oh, yes, yes, yes. To dwell above the ones we love, that's glory. To dwell below the ones we know, that's a different story. Church could never really be all that great. Okay, yeah, there are sinners and there are always going to be sinners, wolves among the sheep, and, and people who are at different places in their walks with the Lord. But let me tell you, friends, the church is wonderful. I love the church. The church is here to strengthen us, to fortify us, to encourage us, to build us up. It doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes we, we fail. But let me tell you, it far outweighs the negatives. The positives far outweigh the negatives. We're here to spur each other on to love each other, to be the light and life that, that this dark world so desperately needs. Christianity isn't for people who have checked their minds at the door. This isn't for a bunch of mindless people that just kind of follow along like lemmings. No, no, no. But it is for people whose minds are bright, and it is for people who mind what God's will is. That mind will say, I, I have to give the mind that God has given me back to him in such a way that he can instruct it about his nature and instruct it about his ways. And that's what it really means to love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. It doesn't mean a mindless Christianity being told what to think, told what to believe all the time. Just do this and do that and be a good person. It means exposing your heart, your mind to, to God so that you might have his mind. He, the omniscient, all-knowing God that he is, well, he's going to begin to share some of who he is with us. Even though we're, we're little dust people with little dust minds, living in little dust bodies, eating dust food, he will give us the capacity to understand him. And when we love him with all of our heart and soul and mind, then we begin to love him with all of our strength. And that's where our story comes in today. I know you're like, well, what? yeah, we're almost to the end, but let me tell you, this story is great. To love God with all of our strength, as Jesus explained to the young lawyer who challenged him, uh, it naturally results in the love that you have for your neighbor that matches your love for yourself. And if you don't love your neighbor as much as you love yourself, then don't say that you love God. See, sometimes we can think that, that we measure the love that we have for God by the feeling that we have when we pray in church or sing in church or eat donuts and drink coffee in church. No, no, that's really not necessarily it. That's part of it, sure. I mean, singing and prayer and 
worship, that's all important. But Jesus says, I want to know about the man in the ditch. I want to know if you're involved yet. I want to know if you got down off your donkey and got alongside the man in the ditch. If you're still on your high religious horse, riding about, riding past the trouble, or, 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 or like the priest and, and the Levite, running to Bible studies and going to the church meetings, and we're too busy for the man in the ditch. If that's so, then don't say that you love God. Because the natural outflow of loving God is to love the man in the ditch. Now those are hard words. And I'm thinking about myself as I, as I say these. Because it's really a challenge to, to realize that God is measuring my love for him by my loving actions toward the man in the ditch. So I'm to love my neighbor as myself. Am I? Is that what you want, Jesus? Says the rich young ruler. So who is my neighbor? Maybe you're asking the same question too. Let me make a few suggestions. Your neighbor is the person in the ditch. It's the, the, the woman who was robbed of her husband by somebody else. It's the person who robbed, a, robbed their children of a father or a mother. It's the, it's the teenager who was robbed of her virginity by her high school date. It's the, the man who was robbed of his reputation by malicious gossip. It, it's the person who was robbed by health, by disease. See, there are plenty of people in the ditch, friends. Plenty. Plenty. It may not always be readily apparent, but they're there. There just aren't nearly enough good Samaritans. Who do you know that's in a ditch? Who do you know that's suffering for one reason or another that could, that could use your encouragement, could, could use your help, could use your assistance? But why don't we get off our donkey and get into the ditch? Let me make a few suggestions as to why we don't get off our donkey. The first is that, that we Christians don't like the risk factor. You know, the good Samaritan didn't look around to see if, if, the, I mean, if the robbers were still there. He might have done that because there was a risk attached to getting off his donkey and getting into the ditch. He might get robbed as well. Another reason we don't get off our donkey and get into the ditch to help whoever is there is that we're afraid that maybe, maybe, we'll get so involved that it will cost us something. And it will. It always costs us something. It costs the Samaritan a lot. It could have cost him a lot more. Do you ever ask questions when you read the scriptures? And you'll never really discover the joy of the Bible unless you're asking questions about the text. Who, what, why, where, when, how. And, and as you do that, the text begins to answer you and it makes it very exciting. And when I came to this text, I wondered, well, uh, okay, I wondered, was this guy fat? Was the guy in the ditch fat? And, and was his donkey old? Was it on its last legs? And you say, well, that's a weird question to ask, Pastor. Why do you ask that? Because I want to know. Because if, if the man was fat and if the donkey was old, that might cost him a whole lot more than I mentioned before. Was the man rich? Could he afford a new donkey? What if it was a fat man sitting on an old donkey and the donkey collapsed or had a broken leg? That's a little picture to bring to the whole bring the whole story to life. But you see, friends, it might be that you'll walk while he rides. Ooh. If you really help the man in the ditch, as some of you may have taken in family or friends and thought they would be there uh, for a few days because they didn't have any other place to live, but uh, what you thought was going to be a week or two turned out to be a year or two or more. And there were times maybe when you walked and he rode. You paid for the food while she ate. You provided room in the inn when it wasn't convenient. Some of you know what it is to be in the ditch, and some of you know how to get off your donkey and get in the ditch to help. Notice, secondly, the Good Samaritan was moved with compassion. Do you, do you remember 
that the whole idea of a heart transplant that Jesus promised, it was something that he gave to us. I will move you because it's a heart of God. That new heart of yours is going to change. It's going to beat for that other person. It's going to beat for that person in the ditch. You don't really have a heartbeat for the person in the ditch unless you get close enough to smell the smells and to feel the tears and to begin to understand. The Samaritan got in the ditch. He put his arms around that young man, lifted him out. Well, who's the person on the side of the road today? Who would you normally avoid? Guy flying a sign, maybe? You know, friends, there are people out there who have enormous needs. A lot of folks don't even know that more than 10% of the population of Surprise, Arizona, lives in poverty. There are, there are moms and kids who have been put out on the street because they can't pay the bills. What about the grandson or the granddaughter who's run away from home because they, they started hanging out with the wrong crowd. Now they want to commit suicide. What about the man who's just lost his wife? And he's lonely as all get out. So there's a risk factor. There's a compassion factor. And finally, there's a fear factor of inadequacy. You say, well, Cliff, <laughs> I'm not a professional Christian like you. No, you're not. And that's probably a good thing. Um, but Cliff, I'm too old, and I'm too poor, or I'm too uneducated, or I'm too dignified, or I'm too busy, or I'm too this, or I'm too that to do anything about it. Well, it's very tempting when you get to be a grandparent to say, well, leave it for the youngins. Or if you're too poor, to say, leave it to the rich. Or if you're too old, or too rich, or too educated, or too busy, Friends, there's a point at which we just simply have to say, do I have the heart of God, or do I still have my stony old heart? Am I a good Samaritan, or am I just a selfish person? You ever ask that question? As long as I'm alive, I want to be able to say to God, whatever the risk, oh Lord, move my heart, move my heart, take my heart. May I have the compassion that you have. Help me to get off my donkey and get into the ditch. To, to put my arms around people who have needs. And to lift them into the inn to do whatever is necessary to rehabilitate them. And then I'll know that I love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. Yeah, the fear factor is there. Yes, I'm inadequate. Uh, I don't know how to lift him anyway. Drop it. Nobody's asked me to do anything, but 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 God has. And isn't that enough? God says to me, say yes. Cliff, just say yes. Love me with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, as I love you. <laughs> Get down in the ditch and do something about the love that I've given you, because as I've already shown you. That kind of love is found on the cross and in my son. See, friends, if you study the early church carefully, you'll find that the disciples boldly spoke the gospel and boldly lived the gospel, and it translated into a whole lot of love. And what happened? The church, the kingdom of God on earth, exploded with growth. And we can do the same as we have the same heart, the same love as Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Please join me in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you didn't leave us in the ditch. That through your Son, Jesus Christ, you got, you got off your proverbial donkey and you came to us. You saw us in our, our fallen state. You saw us having been robbed by Satan himself, by his lies, by his deceit. 
you saw us with our cold, stony hearts, and you said, come to me. And you lifted us up, and you placed us on your operating table. Oh, great physician, you, you took us and you transplanted our stony heart with a heart of flesh so that we might be the lovers that you made us to be, that we might be the lover of your heart, and as a result, the lover of other people's hearts. Help us to bless and honor you this day and always as people who have said, oh, you are enough for me, Lord. Yes, I will follow you. I will obey you. I will love you with all that I am. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, dear friends, receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.